Father, I ask that you anoint my lips, that the words I speak be only those that come from you. And it is all for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 All right, well, what we're going to talk about this week is the power of the tongue. Yeah. It's, it, <laughs> no, that's okay, don't feel bad. I, she's like me. The thought goes in the head and it comes out the mouth. <laughs> There's no filter. <laughs> Can everybody see the board okay? Yeah. Okay, good. We're going to just dig in. And before, uh, before you leave, make sure that you get all of the scriptures that we're going to discuss today. Because there are some things in here that we won't get into detail today that will bless you. So... Just know that these are going to be here for you. So let's, now and again, disclaimer, this is just a small portion of what is found in God's word regarding our words. So if this topic, if you leave and your interest is sparked and you want to know more about it, get your Bible in the back, look up the tongue. There's many, many other verses that you can find. In fact, in the Old Testament, there are even stories you can see the result of some key biblical characters, the result of what they spoke and sometimes what they didn't speak. So it's a very interesting topic, but today we're going to focus on our responsibility, where our help comes from, and just how much good or how much damage we can do. And, you know, well, I have a choice. I'll choose the right thing. Sometimes we forget that we even have a choice until it's too late. And then when we realize, oof, I choose wrong. Ouch. So let's, let's dig in. I've got a list of nine things, and in number nine, we're going to look at some things that Jesus said about our words. But let's start with number one. We have a choice to either speak death or life. You know, when I first read this verse that I'm about to give you, I thought, you know, we, we forget that. And I know that in my, my walk, those that are family or those that we really love, we always hurt the ones we love more so than someone that doesn't know us. Because when we don't know the person, we're on our best behavior. They want, we want them to like us, so we're, we're going to hold some things back, and we want to portray a, a pretty good example of who we are and what we say. But for those family, really good friends, oh, you just, you just say it. And so we do have a choice, and we sometimes forget that. That verse is found in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now I know a lot of you have read that scripture before. It's a very good scripture, we understand it. But I had a visual on that. What would happen if this was literal? If you could literally have somebody fall over dead by what you said? Boy, you'd sure leave a trail. And you would know, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Or if somebody was dead, they were physically uh, gone. And because of the words you spoke, you gave life to them. We would really be excited, wouldn't we? We would really pay attention, wouldn't we? Because I don't know about you, but if you left a trail of dead bodies, you'd be in trouble. So when we look at this verse, what do we see? This is not my opinion. This is God's Word, and God's Word is telling us that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and that is a choice. So let's look at number two. The tongue is a fire, and it defiles the entire body. Well, that's not fair. If my tongue's being unruly, then my tongue should be the one that gets punished. Well, the Word is telling us that it's going to defile the entire body. Oops. Let's look at that. That's found in James chapter 3, verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. 
The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Well, wait a minute. It sets on fire the course of our life. That sounds like it's going to affect where we're walking. It's going to affect our path. So when you take all of these things into consideration, this one again, it becomes personal. I don't think there's anybody here in their right mind that would be okay with our course of life being set on fire. No. So we're learning from, from this verse that there is a, the tongue is a fire and it defiles the entire body and it can really mess up your course in life. Let's go to the next one. Number three, here's a choice. It's an either or, a tree of life or a spirit crusher. Spirit crusher. I always think, did, had, did anybody used to recycle cans and there was this thing they invented where you can crush cans to make them more compact and you put them all in a bag? And I always think of that. If we could literally see the result of our words crushing another person's spirit, that is so wounding. I think if we could physically see this, we would be much more careful in choosing which words we speak. But because we're talking about a spiritual realm, we have a tendency to forget about that. So let's look at that, let's look at that scripture. It's found in Proverbs chapter 5, <laughs> verse 4. A soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. And I, I know earlier we, we came from a lesson and there was a young girl there and she was in tears over something in her family that was recently said to her. And it was, it was days later and she was still weeping when she relayed her story. So, you know, like I said, sometimes the closest ones are the ones that hurt us or we hurt them. So let's look at the next one. Number four, think first. That is a very difficult thing to do. Especially when you're right and they're wrong and they need to know what you think right now because you're right and they're wrong and you need to set them straight. Am I the only one that ever thinks that? It says confess your faults to one another. <laughs> okay, here's one person. <laughs> Let's look at that verse. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Okay, well, that says the heart of the righteous. Well, how many of us in here know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior? Okay, if I were to ask you, are you righteous, what would you say? Yes. 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 It's not a prideful thing. We spent the last two weeks studying who we are in Christ. Remember? In, by, through. So you saying, I am righteous. In fact, we learned last week that we are the righteousness of God. That is not prideful. That's knowing what Jesus accomplished on that cross for us. That free gift that we received, not by works, so we are not boasting. We are righteous solely because of the shed blood of the cross. Now, therefore, we are righteous and we know why. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Amen. You know, when you meet somebody new and you sit down and have a conversation with them, it's only a matter of minutes before you learn a lot about the person's heart. So, well, I still have trouble with that, okay? Well, here's a verse. The heart of the righteous. Father, I am righteous. 
I know I am seen righteous in your sight because of the shed blood of the cross. Therefore, your word tells me, because I am righteous, I should be pondering how to answer. Father, I ask for the fulfillment of your word in me. And I ask this in faith, believing that I'm going to receive. You know what's going to happen? He's going to give you opportunities to practice that. He's going to give you situations and opportunities where you will have an opportunity to ponder. Some of us are slow learners. Usually what happens to me, I'll pray for something, he'll give me an opportunity to practice that, and then I'm praying against the very thing I prayed for originally because I don't recognize he's giving me the opportunity. What is he giving me the opportunity to do? The Bible says the definition of a mature Christian is one who, through practice, is able to discern right from wrong or good from evil. So if you pray, Father, I have a hard time with my tongue. This says that the heart of the righteous is going to ponder how to answer. I'm asking you to do that for me, Lord, and I thank you for hearing my prayer. He's going to give you opportunities to practice that. Recognize it, and no matter how many times it takes, pretty soon with me, fourth, fifth, fifteenth, twentieth time, you get it. So, all right, let's go to the next one. Number five. Here's another choice. Preserve your life or come to ruin. How many of us, if you're in your right mind, you would not choose come to ruin. Some people may choose come to ruin, but they're, they're not all home. Then in life, there would be some, some people that need deliverance, and they would be thinking along that realm. But for us, we want to preserve life. We don't want to come to ruin. Let's see what the Word says about that. You have a choice to either preserve your life or come to ruin and be known as a fool or a wise man. Proverbs 13.3 The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Proverbs 29, 11. A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. Now, I want to look at that one for a little bit. I used to think, well, bad people lose their temper, and good people never lose their temper. Well, if we, if we really look at this verse, it says, A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. What is the wise man holding back? His temper. We're human. So the wisdom comes from not never experiencing anger, but sinning not. Hold it back. And this, this, verse is telling us that a wise man will hold it back. Well, I have a hard time. Well, then, according to the scripture, what you need is wisdom. Right? Because it says a wise man will hold it back. Well, how do we get wisdom? We ask for it. And we ask for it in faith. In the book of James, it says, ask for it, but don't waver. You ask for it in faith, and expect that he's going to answer. Only good and perfect gifts come from the Father. So let's look at another one. Proverbs 17, 27. He who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. <laughs> is a man of understanding. So what is this telling us? If you're restraining your words, you have knowledge. And I keep remembering the verse that says, seek wisdom, but also seek understanding. And here it says, wisdom, if you have wisdom, you're going to restrain your words. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. What is a cool spirit? You know, some people are just good old Joes. 
No matter what anybody does to them, it just falls right off their back. They just have a sweet spirit. Their temperament is cool. Well, according to the word, it says that man is a man of understanding. He understands the benefit. Let's look at the next one. Number six. How many of us would like to keep our soul from troubles? I think that's a, that's a no-brainer. Everybody, everybody would like to keep their soul from troubles. Let's look at what God's Word says. Proverbs 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. So we're seeing great benefit here in God's Word. And I know if you're anything like me at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, but I don't know if I could ever do that. I'm in trouble. Yeah, thanks for telling me all the stuff you get, but I don't think I can ever get there. Well, stay tuned. We're going to cover that. Let's look at 1 Peter 3.10. For he that will love life and see good days. You know, we're, we're not dead yet. We're still here. So we still have life. So since we're still here and we still have life, how many of us would want to love our life and see good days? That's all of us. Okay. Well, this says, if you want that, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. So we're starting to see some, all of these benefits, all of these benefits, promises right out of God's word of what we will get. If, it's if, then. Let's look at the next one. Number seven. Here's another choice. Our words can cut like a knife, or they can heal. And I always go back to a visual. Let's suppose that for an hour, everything you said that was hurtful or harmful to someone actually physically cut their flesh and they bled. How many walking wounded would be wandering around the hallways because of what we said? <laughs> and on the alternate, if someone was very ill, and for an hour we would see the manifestation of this, of our words, and we, the people that were really sick, we went to them and we spoke life to them, and they would be healed. I wonder what we would be saying for the next hour. Well, this is saying in Proverbs 12, 18, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Well, I'm not very wise. Well, let's go over that again. How do we get wisdom? We ask for it with faith. And in James it says, he will give it to you and upbraideth not. Let's look at the next one. Let's look at number eight. Here's, a, here's another big one. Words can minister grace to the hearers. Well, I didn't know I, I had that capability. Let's look at that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It's not my opinion. We read it. Now let's look at what Jesus says. Jesus had some things to say about words, what we speak. We're going to look at your words will justify you or condemn you. Ouch. Words with faith are powerful, and what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. So, remember I promised you earlier, we were going to see on, see, don't be scared. There's going to be some, some stuff in here that's going to uplift you, edify you, and encourage you. Let's look at what Jesus says. In Matthew 12, 36 and 37, Jesus said, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, are we people? Last I checked, we're all people. 
Every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified. Who remembers what justified means? Just as if I've never sinned. Now, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Would you rather be justified or condemned? It's not a trick question. <laughs> what words can justify us? Who paid the price for us? Jesus. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, of God, who's your attorney? It's the best attorney you could ever have. He bought you. He purchased you. He, because of the shed blood of the cross, we can go boldly to the throne of grace. So, there are some words that need to be spoken. Father God, I come before you and I realize that I'm a sinner and I understand I need a Savior. I believe that Jesus was the only begotten Son of God that you sent for the world, that he shed his blood on the cross for the sins of the world, and that by grace through faith am I saved. I receive your grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. I believe he rose on the third day. Therefore, I am seen as righteous in your sight. Those words, and some people refer to it as a sinner's prayer. It's not the same group of words. But every person that comes to repentance and to the cross, seeking salvation, forgiveness, at that point, they've received the free gift. So, would you say that those words that are spoken are justifying them? Yes. Whereas the second part here, by your words, you will be condemned. Oh, I, don't need, I don't need to be saved. I've been a good person. That's good for you. You have an imaginary friend. But I lived a good life. I raised my kids right. I went to church every Sunday, so I'm okay. By their words, they will be condemned. Because there's only one way to the Father. How many remember? How, how do we get there? The Rue, the Son. So do you see how this, this is personal? Let's look at the next one, Luke 6.45. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. Now listen to this. This is what I want you to focus on. For out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. Now, let's just take that last portion of that. This is God's word. So we know it's true, right? Out of the abundance of a person's heart, his mouth will speak. So to me, I look at that and I say, well, if a person is not speaking good things, then he has a heart problem, right? It's his heart that needs to be dealt with. A person that has good things in their heart, they're going to say good things. So how, how we're going to look at how a person's heart can be changed. Because that's what we need to look at, the heart. Let's look at what else we have here. How can our hearts be changed? Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also I will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. What happens at that point of salvation? There's a little bit of spiritual surgery going on. Because at that moment of true conversion, your old heart, that old heart, that all of that stuff is coming out of your mouth, that old heart is taken away. 
and it's replaced with the heart of flesh, with a brand new heart. On that new heart are written all of the laws. On that new heart and in your mind. So therefore, not only are you, is your, your conversation, your words going to change, but you now have a new nature. Those laws and rules aren't something that you have to keep. I can do it. I will do it. I need to do it. No. It becomes a part of you. You're automatically going to walk that out. It's the same thing with your words. Does it mean that the next day, or some of us, the next year, are going to be perfect? No. Because remember, the definition of a mature Christian is one who through practice. Remember, there's no condemnation. One day when we're going to study the difference between condemnation, conviction, and guilt. There's three different things. The Holy Spirit, who you also get at that moment of conversion, our seal, our earnest. We're led by God's Holy Spirit. We're led where? Who can remember where we're led? Into all truth. It sounds like a win-win situation to me. We just need to hear his voice and obey. So, we're get, we get a new heart. And we will have opportunities to practice. And as we mature in him, I know with me, all I can speak of is personal experience. In the beginning, people would hurt me because I believed what everybody said. I defined myself by what other people said until I started realizing that person's heart's messed up. I need to pray for that person. I'm not what they're saying. That, that does not belong to me. You begin to look at when Jesus was on the cross. If anybody endured at the hands of others, it was Jesus on that cross. How many remember what Jesus said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When people hurt us with their words, we need to forgive them. They don't know these things. They don't realize these things. Because remember I said, for an hour, if this became literal, we would see wounded people all over the place, bleeding all over the floor. So it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 21 to 25. If so be that you have heard him, we're talking about Jesus, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. And in the King James Bible, conversation means life. You put off that old life, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now listen to this. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. And sometimes... Speaking the truth is scary. Well, they're going to get mad at me if I speak the truth. They're going to get mad at me. They're not going to like me. I forget exactly where, where it's at. It's either first or second Peter. If anybody knows, holler at me. It is better to suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. So, all right, let's move on. 
Let's move on. So, how can, since we've determined that this all stems from a heart issue, because we've learned today that out of the abundance of our hearts, our mouth speaks. So therefore, mm, I need to work on this. How can that happen? Let's look at Luke 11, 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that are worth it? No. To them who behave. No. To them that ask him. Ask. Well, I don't know how. Okay. Father, your word says that I, I need to be more careful with how I speak because now I realize that I'm making choices and it's hard for me to, to wait, to ponder, and I want to make sure that I minister grace and I want to make sure that I'm uplifting and not crushing spirits. So, Father, I realize that out of the abundance of my heart is what I'm going to say. So, Father perform surgery in my heart. Give me a clean heart so that the words I speak will be uplifting and edifying. And I ask this in faith because I know I'm praying your will. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Is he going to answer that prayer? You better believe it. Now what's going to happen? He's going to bring about situations in your life where you have the opportunity to practice. And it took me a while to get that. Because I pray for something, he would bring a situation into my life to practice it, and I start praying for that very practicing experience to go away. <laughs> we don't like being bothered, do we? And you know, it's not hard. Because we can't do any of this in and of ourselves. Let me reassure you right now. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ask him. It's that simple. All right, let's, let's go on to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now, you come to the realization through the law, I can't keep them. I need a Savior. I can never keep those. And just for, for those that think, yes, I can, let's revisit what Jesus said. Jesus said, well, you, you heard it that if you commit adultery, oh boy, but I'm telling you that if you even look at another woman with lust, you've committed it. Well, that's not fair. That's the whole point. Jesus is trying to get it into our heads. You cannot earn salvation. So what does that do? Oh, man, I'm in trouble now. I can't keep them. Great! You're exactly where you need to be. Therefore, at that point, you realize, I need a Savior. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are saved by grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, through faith, I believe. At that moment, put on the new man. Was it here that we talked about burying your dog, your dead dog? If you had a dog that you just loved, you had this dog for years, and it died, and you bury it in the backyard, and then every six months when you start missing your dog, and you go out with a shovel, and you dig up this, this rotting corpse of a dog, your neighbors are going to start thinking you've lost it. But yet how many of us in this life keep digging up the dead dog? Let it Go. His mercies are new every morning. Oh, woohoo! I can go do it. No. No. 
the good work that he started in you, he will perform, he will complete, and he will perfect until the day you die or he calls us home. Oh, that means I don't have to do anything. No, it means you are led and guided by God's Holy Spirit. Obey, recognize the voice. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep, they hear me. They know my voice. They follow me. The voice of a stranger, they will not follow. Does that mean that we'll never hear a voice of a stranger? No. It means we will hear it, but we will know. Uh-uh. I ain't going on that one. I'm not going that way. I don't know that guy. Or I know that guy. And he's a liar. There's so much in this. And it's simple. It's simple. So, now that we know we've received God's Holy Spirit at that moment of conversion, along with getting a new heart, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, we are a temple of God's Holy Spirit. We don't even belong to ourselves anymore. And now we're about to read, all of this was a preface for this verse. Now I'm about to read the fruit of of that Holy Spirit living inside of you. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Does that mean we're going to wake up the next day and we're going to be perfect? No. But, like we learned last week, you will produce much fruit. It is a journey. It is a walk. Our minds are constantly being renewed by the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is going to lead us and guide us. So, how do we get new hearts? We get new hearts through salvation, and you ask Him, Ask Him to change your heart so that the words that you speak will speak life and not death. That you will be a tree of life instead of crushing spirits. You will preserve your life and not come to ruin. You will keep your soul from troubles. I keep thinking of that verse, and they pierce themselves with many sorrows. How many people blame God for stuff that they messed up? There are consequences. We want our words to heal and not cut like a knife. We want to minister grace to people. So, there's so much responsibility in our words. I want, I want you to focus on, our. just imagine our words do physical impact. I, I learned with visual. And just imagine, for the rest of your life, the words you spoke, you're, the person's going to leave you leaving a trail of blood, or they're going to be uplifted and get closer to Him because of what you said. And you know what? That takes fruit of the Holy Spirit because you have to be long-suffering. If you have peace, nobody's going to disturb that. You have to have gentleness, meekness, and temperance. So, I don't want to leave anybody troubled. Does everybody understand now that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? And if you're having trouble with what you are verbalizing, it is a heart issue. And Jesus himself said, how much more will he give? the Holy Spirit, to those that ask. And we know that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is everything we need in order to have a renewed mind and heart and to speak life and grace to those around us. This is huge. So all of the verses that we went over today, and there's extras in here, you can take with you and, and, and ponder these. Because if you are having issues and you don't know how to pray, when you pray, read these scriptures and say, Father, this says 
I'm standing on your word that you're going, it's your will that I do a better thing. I don't want to be in the death category. I want to be in the life category. I give it to you. Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Amen. So don't be bummed out. <laughs> Everybody looks like I just beat you up. <laughs> I don't want to leave you that way. <laughs> it's good. It's all good. So my people perish for lack of knowledge, but now you know. And you know that it's a hard issue. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There's a prayer right there. And watch people's faces. When you start doing this, you're ministering grace to people. You watch them change. And the nastier they are, eventually, you're going to see difference. All right. You want to do another song? Uh, uh, maybe Sharon would like Sharon, to play a couple of pieces on the piano. Mm -hmm. We'll close with some, some music and then we'll close in prayer. And I'll give you all of the verses for the